Hello, welcome back. Let's get started for today. The lecture for today is going to focus on electric circuits. This is something that we take advantage of every day from morning until night and everywhere in between, right? Um, so it's good to have a basic understanding of how electric circuits work and in the electric things that you use like cell phones um, to the electric wiring in your home to, you know, the high power lines that you see outside your house, right? How do these things work and how do they carry electricity and how is electricity useful for us? Let me share my screen. So we're going to focus in on electric circuits and describing what happens in an electric circuit. From the simplest case, we'll get the basics of the simplest case with the battery connected to a light bulb. But obviously, there's much more complicated cases as well. The circuitry that's in your laptop, for example, or your, or your computer or desktop at home. Um, but the basic principles behind all of these circuits uh, we will discuss in this chapter. And they can kind of all use an analogy of, of a pump, shown down here in the animation at the bottom. When you have a simple circuit with a battery connected to, for example, one light bulb, okay, the battery acts as a, as a pump. It pumps uh, electric charge. Okay. And what a pump is, is basically it boosts the energy of that electric charge, right? It gives it some potential energy, as you can see here. And as the charge, uh, as that you know electric charge has potential energy, as it flows through the circuit, that potential energy is converted into other forms of energy, like light energy or heat energy. And then the cycle starts all over again. So in, a, in an electric circuit, um, energy conservation still applies. Energy provided by the battery is exhausted by all of the circuit loads or circuit elements, like light bulb, for example. And so a lot of the times this analogy is used, it's kind of like a water pump, right? The water is pumped up from the well, it flows through the fountain and then back down into the well again. Okay. But as it's flowing, it can do work, like turn a paddle wheel or something like that. Okay. Same, same idea behind an, an electric circuit. The battery provides some potential energy to, this, to the charges here. As they flow, that potential energy is used up in circuit elements like light bulbs. And so we're going to describe what is the flow of this charge, right? How much energy, how much potential is provided by the battery? How much potential is lost after the charge flows through, um, you know, a light bulb, for example? And so we've all seen these <laughs> power stations in our everyday lives, right? At least when I look out my window, I can see the power lines with these little things up there called transformers. What is that and what do they do? And what is electric current to begin with, right? Well, let's again go back to the simplest case. Let's suppose I gave you a wire, a light bulb, and a battery. How would you configure these three elements to make the light bulb light up? Think about it for a second, pause the video, and think about if I actually gave you this kit right here, right now, how could you get the light bulb to light up? Well, for the light bulb to light up, what we need to have is a closed or complete circuit. So some of the some of the ways that students have tried to do this that I've seen is that they connect the battery straight to the light bulb. Unfortunately, this is not a closed circuit. Charge will not flow here. The battery has, has provided a pump for the charge, but there's no way for the, for the charge to flow back down, right? And get re-energized by the pump again, right? So this is not going to light up the light bulb. In situation B, 
the light bulb is also not going to light up because although you have a, a circuit here, the light bulb is not part of that circuit, right? The charges are going to flow through this wire back down into the battery, but the light bulb isn't, isn't connected here, right? Do you see that the charge will just flow through the wire and back to the positive end of the battery? And it doesn't actually flow through the, the light bulb. The last uh, picture shown here is the example where you could get current to flow. Okay, so the current could come out of the bottom of the, the negative end of the negative terminal of the battery, right? And since I've connected it to the light bulb itself, the current will flow through the light bulb and the light bulb filament, and then it will go back down to the positive end of the battery, and the whole cycle will start back all over again. So key takeaway here is that for current and electric charges to actually flow, you need to have a closed or complete circuit. So make sure that the circuit has been completed. Now, what does a battery actually do? Um, a battery, there's different types of batteries, obviously, but a battery is an energy source. And like we've been saying, it's kind of like a pump. And ultimately, if you looked inside the battery, what you would see is, and don't do this at home, <laughs> but what you would see is um, an ele a chemical reaction taking place. So there's actually a chemical reaction taking place. There's battery acid, as you all know, inside of a battery. It's a chemical reaction taking place that forces negative charge to flow over here to the anode or negative terminal of the battery. That means that there is a buildup of positive charge on the cathode or positive end of the battery. It's just from a chemical reaction that's taking place with the, with the chemicals in that battery. The electrolyte in here prevents the negative charges that have built up on the anode to be able to flow backward to the cathode. Because remember, negative charges are attracted to positive charge, right? So they really would like to flow back through the battery and get to the positive terminal of the battery, but they can't. The electrolyte prevents that. So there's nowhere, there's nowhere for, the, for the charges to flow here inside the battery until I connect it to an external conducting path. So once I connect this to an external conducting path as shown in the green wire here, the buildup of negative charges on the anode now have a path to flow through, right? They can't go back through the electrolyte, but they can go through the wire. And since when they go through the wire, they can, they can hit circuit elements like light bulbs and other things. And then they can flow back and they finally reach the cathode or the positive end of the battery, which is where they want to be. And then the whole cycle starts all over again, right? The battery again is, there's a chemical reaction taking place. The negative charges end up over here. The positive charges end up on the cathode and the whole cycle starts over. So when you see a battery that says, say, for example, it's a 1.5 volt battery, remember voltage is electric potential. And there's electric potential happening inside the battery. Potential is, the, is very similar concept to potential energy, right? So what, what a 1.5 volt battery means is that it's providing 1.5 joules of energy for every coulomb of charge that passes through this battery. Remember, voltage is a joule, it's an energy uh, a voltage is a joule per coulomb. Okay. It's how much energy each 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 coulomb of charge is gaining. Okay. And so, for a one point five volt battery, that means that every every coulomb of charge that passes through this battery gains potential energy of one point five joules. Okay, that's all that means. And since it gains potential energy, 
that potential energy wants to go somewhere. And so if I connect this conducting wire, it passes through the light. And that potential energy is converted into light and heat energy. And so once the charges now start to flow, we have electric current. Electric current is the flow of electric charge. Okay. And it can you can have a very fast current, right? Very fast moving current or slow mo moving current. So it also depends on how much charge is flowing over a given period of time, right? So current, we denote this with the letter I. And it's the amount of charge that flows every second. Through a cross section of the wire. So if I looked at this cross section of the wire right here, and I looked at after one second, how many charges have flown through this cross section, I would know the current. The units, therefore, for electric current, it's a cool, it's a charge per second, so it's a coulomb per second. But that's also known as an ampere or amp. So, for example, if I have three coulombs of charge flowing through a wire in two seconds. Right, the current is going to be three coulombs of charge divided by two seconds. This is 1.5 coulombs per second or amps. Now notice that the picture on the top shows positive charges moving. And in reality, what's happening is that negative charges are the ones that are flowing, right? The electrons are the ones that are flowing because those are the charges that are free to move around in a conductor. The positive charge is usually fixed in place. Um, but positive charge is moving to the right. It has the same effect as negative charge moving to the left. And mathematically, there is no difference between positive charges moving to the right and negative charges moving to the left. We'll get the same answers either way. So, um, you know, in your textbook or in other problems, it may talk about the flow of positive charge. Just remember that in reality, the negative charges or the electrons are the ones that are flowing, but mathematically, you get the same result either way. The direction of the current, conventionally speaking, the way our textbook uses and many other textbooks, is the direction that positive charges would flow. In reality, the charge carriers are the negatively charged electrons. Now going back to this battery, uh, this pump analogy, right? The battery acts as a pump. It provides potential and potential energies of the charges and causes them to start to move, right? And there's a flow of current. However, um, in addition to the energy source and a conducting path, a circuit also includes some resistance. The resistance in this diagram down here on the left is shown as this little paddle wheel. Right? So the battery provides energy to the charges. That energy is used up to turn the paddle wheel. And then the whole, the whole process starts all over again. The resistance is akin to this little paddle wheel here. In electricity, the resistance in a light bulb, for example, you can look inside and see a little tiny filament inside of your light bulb. This filament has a high resistance. 
it's resistant to the flow of charge. And what that means is that as charges flow through this part, there's a lot of friction in a way. There's a lot of resistance to their motion. And because there's a lot of friction and resistance to the electron's motion here, there's going to be heat generated. There's also, pot, there's also light generated as well because of this high resistance. Depending on the energy output of your light bulb, if you don't connect a, a battery that provides enough energy to match that of the light bulb, the light bulb won't light up, right? You've got to have a battery that provides at least as much energy to be um, emitted from the light bulb, right? Otherwise, it won't light up. So when you screw in a light bulb, at the bottom, you see this metal contact. If this, is if this is connected to the circuit, the current will come through here. There's a metal contact, so the current can flow through the metal up through the conducting wire, through the filament, back down through, and then it exits over here. There's an insulator right here because if that insulator wasn't there, right? Um, the 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 uh, the current would not flow into the filament at all, right? If this was just pure metal, okay, notice that the current would just come here, and it's got a, it's it's not going to go through an area of high resistance. The current is going to always follow the path of least resistance. So if there's just you know metal here as opposed to a, a high resistance, it's just going to flow through the metal back out again and never go through the filament. So that's why this insulator is here. Um, but every, every conducting wire, even copper wire, has some level of resistance to it. Um, but other types of wire like tungsten filaments have a, a much higher resistance. So I have a question for you. In the circuit shown, the wires are connected to either side of a wooden block, as well as the light bulb. Will the light bulb light in this arrangement? Yes, no, maybe, or impossible to tell. Pause the video, think about it for a second, and choose your answer. The correct answer here is no, the current will not flow, and the light bulb will not light up in this arrangement because of the high resistance of the wooden block. Because the wooden block has such high resistance, it's going to prevent current from flowing from the battery. The battery just does not have enough energy. It's not providing enough energy to overcome the high resistance of the wood block and the current will not flow. Therefore, the light bulb will not light up here, even though we have a closed circuit. In the circuit shown below, Another question for you. In the circuit shown below, could we increase the brightness of the bulb by connecting a wire between points A and B? So if I put a, just a conducting wire right here, would that increase the light brightness of the bulb or not increase it or maybe, or is it impossible to tell from the figure? Think about it for a second, pause the video and then come back and we'll talk about it. The correct answer here is no, and so let's talk about why. If I put a conducting wire from point A to point B, just a copper conducting wire right here, and here's my battery. This is the symbol for a battery. This funny looking E is just telling me what's the voltage rating of the battery. So if it's a 1.5 volt battery, that's what the E stands for, 1.5 volts. This is the positive end of the battery because it's the longer end, and here's the negative side. So let's think about how the current would flow here. 
the conventional current, the flow of positive charge is going to flow away from the positive end of the battery and want to flow back towards the negative terminal of the battery. So the current is going to flow out this way. And it's going to get to this junction right here at point A. Right? The light bulb has a, has a resistance to it, right? The conducting wire right here has very little resistance to it. If it's copper, it has very little resistance. It's got a little bit, but much smaller than the bat and than the light bulb would have. So when the current gets to this point, most of this current is going to pass through here. It's going to pass through the through the path of least resistance. There's going to be very little current flowing through the light bulb, probably not enough to light it up at all. What this is called is a short circuit. You've created a situation in which current can flow from the battery through a wire and back again without having any loads on it, without having any light bulbs or any other things with resistance in my circuit. If this happens, what you will see is that the current is going to become really big. Okay? There's, not, there's no resistance to the current, so the current's going to become very big. And this is, this is actually a bad thing <laughs> because this can, um, this can overheat your battery. And it can also overheat your copper wires to the point where they might even start to melt. So this is actually a bad situation when this happens in homes all the time, right? This is what causes fires in homes because the wires overheat. You've got a short circuit. The wires start to overheat and your home can catch on fire. Okay. So short circuits are a bad thing. And this is the reason why. No resistance to the current. The current begets, becomes huge. It heats up your battery and your, and your wires to the point where they start to melt. One more concept question for you. Which of the two circuits shown below will cause the light bulb to light? Arrangement A, arrangement B, both or neither. Remember this little symbol right here with one line longer than the other is the symbol for the battery. And this one is the symbol for the light bulb with a little resistor inside. The, the squiggly lines stand for the resistor. The correct answer here is arrangement B. Arrangement A, no current is going to flow here because I haven't completed the circuit. I need to have one end of my circuit connected to the positive terminal of the battery. One end of the circuit needs to be connected to the negative terminal of the battery. That's not happening here. So no current is going to flow in circuit A. In circuit B, if the switch is open, no current's going to flow because the end of my battery, the positive end of my battery is not connected to the negative end, right? So it won't flow. But once I close the switch, it will start to flow. Now, what's the relationship between electric potential or voltage resistance of the circuit and current? Ohm's law is what tells us the relationship between these three variables. And it tells us that the current that flows through a portion of the circuit is proportional to the voltage different across that portion of the circuit and inversely proportional to the resistance. So across the resistor, say for example the resistor is a light bulb, right? There's going to be a potential drop, right? Potential energy drop across that light bulb. 
because that's happening and because there's a resistor here, I can calculate what the current is flowing through this light bulb by using Ohm's law. Now this is the relationship between these three variables. This doesn't mean that current depends upon the resistance or depends upon the voltage drop. This doesn't mean that resistance depends on current or potential, right? This is just the relationship. I kind of relate it to the old F net equals MA. Okay. Does the mass of the object depend on the net force acting on it? No. This is just telling me the relationship between these three variables and how they're connected. But it, but the mass of the object depends upon its density and its size, right? It doesn't depend upon the net force acting on it. It's the same thing here. The resistance of a wire doesn't depend upon the current that flows through it or the potential drop across it. But it does depend upon the properties of the material. Material. It is proportional to the length of the wire and inversely proportional to the cross-sectional area of the wire. And it also depends upon the material, right? Copper is a, is a material that has a very low resistance as opposed to tungsten, which has a little bit higher of a resistance. Resistance also depends upon the temperature of the material. We won't get into that dependence in this class, but just know that as the wire gets hotter and hotter, it's going to have more resistance to it. So concept question for you. The resistance of a resistor depends upon the voltage drop across it, the current passing through it, its cross-sectional area, or its length. Think about it for a second. Pause the video, choose your answer, and then we'll go over it together. The correct answer here is that it depends upon its cross-sectional area and its length. It does not depend upon the voltage or current passing through it. That's, it's related to those variables, but it doesn't depend on those variables. It's a property of the material itself. And you can see this almost in your everyday life when you look at high power lines. Notice high power line, how high power vol voltage lines are very long, right? They are extremely long. As the length of those high power lines get longer and longer, the resistance of those high power lines are going to get bigger and bigger, right? So how do they counteract that, right? How does how do you get any power to your home if you know, you're losing power due to the resistance of these wires. Well, they make the cross-sectional area of those wires very big. Right? Have you ever seen them? They're very thick. Okay. To counteract the fact that the wires are very, very long. And so you still get a good power um, being transmitted to your home without much loss in terms of the resistance across those wires. So if we know the resistance of a given portion of a circuit and the applied voltage, we can calculate the current through that portion of the circuit, right? So for the simplest case, if I have a 1.5 volt battery connected to a 20 ohm resistor in the form of a light bulb, can I determine the current flowing here? Yeah. Because it's because the battery is providing 1.5 volts of potential that means that there's 1.5 volts of a potential drop across this light bulb. So the potential drop across the light bulb has to be 1.5 volts. So the current, therefore, flowing here is going to be the potential drop, delta V, divided by the resistance of the light bulb. 1.5 volts drop across the light bulb, 20 ohms of resistance. By the way, this funny looking symbol is ohms, and that's the unit for resistance.
So the current flowing through this circuit is going to be 0 0.075, and current is in terms of amps. And that current flows for this particular circuit is the same everywhere. So the current going through the battery must be 0 0.075 amps. The current going through this portion of the wire is 0 0.75 amps. The current going through the um, light bulb is 0 0.075 amps. Whatever's, whatever current's going in has to be the same current coming out. And there can't be any buildup of charge anywhere in the circuit because, you know, if you have a buildup of negative charge, that wouldn't make sense because they're all repelling each other. So the current is just going to continually flow, and in all parts of the circuit, it's going to be the same 0 0.075 amps. Now what happens when a battery dies? As the battery dies, what happens is that um, that chemical reaction that takes place in the battery doesn't happen as well anymore. It's not as efficient. The electrolyte kind of starts to break down a bit too. And the internal resistance of the battery gets very large. So large, so, that, so even, even inside a battery, it can have a resistance to it. And this resistance can get really, really big after a long time due to the fact that that electrolyte is breaking down and the chemical reaction isn't taking place as well anymore. And so the battery can actually become a big source of resistance. And if, it, if the resistance gets big enough, there won't be any current flowing at all. And the battery can no longer produce a measurable current. So that's what happens when a battery dies. The next portion of this chapter is about series versus parallel circuits. Okay. So what do I mean by series versus parallel? Well, I think the best way to do it is just draw. So let's, let's draw a circuit. Here's my battery. And in this circuit, I have two resistors that are light bulbs. connected to the battery just like this. We would say that the light bulbs are in series with each other and in series with the battery. So if I follow the current flow here, it's going to come out of the positive end of the battery. Current flow is going to come around. The current coming into this light bulb is the same current that's coming into this light bulb is the same current that's going back into the battery over here. So they're all kind of lined up in line with each other, they're in series with each other, and there's no breaks in the circuit. There's no junctions here. So this is what we would call a series circuit. A parallel circuit, on the other hand, looks something like this. Here's my battery again. The current's going to come out of the battery. And, then, and what happens is, is that the current gets to this junction right here. And the current has an opportunity to split. Some of it's going to go this way. And some of it's going to go this way. So the current in these, batter in these light bulbs is not necessarily the same. right? If they're not the same light bulb, you're not going to have the same current going through. And then you've got the current coming back into this junction over here. And then the current flows back this way, back to the battery again. But this is a situation in which the light bulbs are in what we would call parallel with each other.
if these are identical light bulbs, okay, and let's just suppose for, sim for just the simplest cases that we connect this to a 12 volt battery. Okay, so the battery is providing 12 volts of potential here and 12 joules per coulomb of potential energy. If these are identical light bulbs with the same resistance in them, what that means is that the potential drop across each of these light bulbs is the same and they should add up to the potential increase by the battery, which is 12 volts. So each of these light bulbs is going to have a 6 volt drop across them. But they're going to have the same current going through each one. And let's think about what happens for the parallel case. So for two light bulbs in parallel, again, if this is a 12 volt battery, and let's suppose these are identical light bulbs with the same resistance in them. Okay. What that means is that each of these light bulbs actually has 12 voltage drop across each one. Notice, like, as if, as if this thing provided, you know, one coulomb with 12 joules of energy, right? <laughs> and it's, you know, passing through this thing, you know. There's nothing here or here or here or anywhere along this path to decrease that potential energy, right? So the potential energy at this point and this point for each of these light bulbs is the same. And on the other side, the potential energy has to be basically zero volts because it ends up on the negative terminal of the battery over here. So each of these light bulbs has the same potential drop. They're in parallel with each other. But they don't necessarily have, they're not going to have the same current flow, right? The current's going to come out of the 12 volt battery, come to this junction, and if the and if the light bulbs are identical, the current will split equally between them. So the current passing through here will be I over 2, and the current passing through this one will be I over 2. So they don't have the same current flow through, through them, but they do have the same potential drop. They have this, they're using up the same amount of you know, energy, and they're converting that potential energy into other forms of energy. So in series, the light bulbs have the same uh, current flowing through them, but they don't have the same potential as the battery. In parallel, the, the light bulbs have the same potential across each one, but they don't have the same current. Okay. And so now I, what I want you to do is make a prediction and think about which one is going, if I put these two light bulbs in this circuit and I put these two light bulbs in this circuit, are the light, light bulbs going to be brighter in the series circuit or are the light bulbs going to be brighter in the parallel circuit or is there not going to be any difference at all? Make a prediction. Pause the video, make a prediction, write down what you think, which situation is going to be brighter or less bright or more brighter, however you think it's going to go. Okay. And let's do this together. So what I'm going to do now is actually bring up a simulation that will show that actually, that actually happens. So this is a neat little simulation that you can use online to kind of build your own circuits, right? And on the top, I built a, a circuit that has two light bulbs in series with one another, just like we talked about before. Here's my battery, here's my two light bulbs, and the switch is open, so the current isn't flowing yet. Okay. On the bottom, I have a circuit that has two light bulbs that are in parallel with each other and in parallel with the battery as well. 
So which one do you think is gonna be brighter? We're gonna close the switches and find out. So here's, I close the switch here. The current isn't very fast. And you can see the light bulbs aren't very bright. Let's close this switch now on the bottom and see what happens. So notice that the light bulbs in the situation in parallel are actually brighter than the light bulbs that are in series with one another. Notice that the current is actually higher in the situation where you have the two in parallel. The electrons are moving faster. As I add more resistors in series with each other, like is shown up here on the top. I'm increasing the total resistance of my circuit, right? There's a lot more things that this has to go through, right? And it's slowing down the current. That means that these aren't gonna be very bright. On the other hand, as I add more resistors in parallel with each other, a really weird thing happens. The total resistance of the circuit goes down. There's more paths for the current to flow through, allowing the current to flow faster. And also, since both of these have the potential of, you know, 12 volt battery across each of them, they're going to be brighter. These only have a potential drop of six volts. So they're not gonna be as bright on the top, but on the bottom, they're getting the full potential of that battery, which is 12 volts. So they're gonna have the full you know, energy to use and they're gonna be a lot brighter. This is actually an important concept for the way our homes are wired. Our homes are not wired in series. Can you imagine having every single thing plugged in with each other? Your light, your computer, your cell phone, your this, your that, whatever. Every, your toaster, your oven, everything plugged in series with each other. That'd be a disaster. You would have so many resistors all in series with each other. You'd have barely any current flowing through, right? nothing would work properly, <laughs> okay? What, what actually happens in our homes is that everything is wired in parallel with each other, right? So I've got your main line, 120 volts, right, is your main line. Okay? The way your household is wired, every time you plug in, you're getting the full potential of that main line, right? 120 volts, whether it's a light bulb, whether it's a toaster, whether it's your TV, you've got they're each getting the full 120 volt drop across it. Other appliances have an even larger 240 volt outlet. The problem is that as you in, as you plug in more appliances, the current is going to actually increase, kind of like we saw in that little simulation. There is a maximum current that your home can provide. Okay, so if you go down and you look in your basement at your circuit breaker or your, you know, your fuse box, you will see there's a rating on there. It's like you can't go more than this many amps, right? If you plug in too many things at once, what happens? Your circuit breaks. It's meant to do that okay, because it can't handle more than so many amps of current flowing through it. Because that's what, again, what, ha well, what will happen is that your wires will start to heat up. They're going to get too hot. There's potential for a fire, right? So it just blows out after a certain point. And that's, that's a safety feature. That is the end of my slides on electric currents and electric circuits. So um, I hope that this will help you work through your homework and I hope that it helps you kind of solidify some of the concepts in this chapter. 
Um, and if you need any extra help, please stop by office hours. I'm happy to help.